So hi everyone, I think I know everyone in this room. <laughs> um, but for those, we're, we're doing a lot of things, so for those who don't know me, I'm Kathleen Gage. I'm uh, one of the city co-founders of Ladies at US Fund in Ontario. Um, my co-founder over there is Ashley Keller, who's typing away. <laughs> um, so thank you guys so much for coming. I know it's a long weekend, and uh, it's really nice you guys came out and checking out with us and uh, listen to some of our comments. So thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share a quick agenda. So we're going to have a welcome intro, um, then we're going to hear from uh, Lighthouse Labs. We're going to hear from Allison. She's going to talk about a really exciting program that's coming to London uh, to help um, anyone who's interested in learning more about development. Then we're going to talk about uh, the last workshop that we did on the weekend, just do a little recap of that. Um, then I'm going to talk about the session conference um, that I went to about three weeks ago, um, share some of the key findings that um, I had while I was there. Um, and then we're going to have a little break and we're going to talk about uh, conversational UX. Ashley put together this really awesome presentation to share with you guys about that. So a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Rhino Lounge. Like, they provided this amazing space that we're here in today and this awesome food. So, um, and Lighthouse Labs um, sponsored by kind of uh, paying for, the, <laughs> for that stuff. So uh, I want to thank them both very much. So. Um, so now I'm just going to open the floor up to Allison and she's gonna, she can talk to you guys about the programs at uh, Lighthouse Labs. Um, so yes, I'm here representing Lighthouse Labs tonight. Um, some of you may be familiar with Lighthouse Labs as um, they came to London last year to host the HTML 500, which was a huge event down at the convention center. We had 500 people in one room in one day learning how to do code. And the whole point of that event was really to dispel myths surrounding um, you know, development and programming and that Coding doesn't have to be the scary thing that basements can do. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's in this day and age, it's something that everybody is going to need to learn how to do, and it's going to be a part of um, you know every role and, and all careers kind of going forward. So, Lighthouse Labs is an organization that was launched in 2013 by developers for developers. So, they first started in Vancouver. Um, now, they also have an office in Toronto. And why we're talking about it here in London is because they are launching what are called satellite programs all across Canada. So they're trying to bring the learning that they offer in Toronto and Vancouver out to some smaller centers who normally would have the opportunity to access it. So in October, and Kathleen has put together these wonderful slides and I'm not even using them. <laughs> um, in October, we're going to be using, we're going to be running an intro to web development course. So this is a part-time course for people who are interested in learning a little bit more about code. You know, perhaps you kind of have fiddled with it or you are really keen to learn more, but you're not really considering development as a career. Or if you are, you're not quite sure if it's for you yet. So it's twice a week um, for three hours, Monday and Wednesday evenings that will run. Um, we're still finalizing where the venue is going to be, but will be a central location here in London. Um, and you know, these are kind of the stats um, on the course and what it's all about. And there's also some postcards all around the room which have some information on them as well. Um, and this is what you learn in the course. So basically, it's an overview of all of the various languages that industry is commonly using. So because it's a part time and it's an intro, you're not going to go super in depth into all of these languages. But by the end of it, you will have a solid understanding. You'll, have, you'll understand basic app and web development. And as I mentioned, these are the folks who it's great for. So people who have never coded before and are thinking they might just want to try it out. Um, people who want to enhance their skill set in their current roles. So a lot of folks like you who are in the communications field um, do take this course and find it really just enhances what they do in their day-to-day -day role. There's also a lot of folks who are working as um, project or product managers. So they're managing development teams and they just really want to be able to better understand you know, their day-to-day -day 
and be able to lay out that project a lot more efficiently by having that understanding. And like I mentioned, people who may want to become developers, and that's what this bootcamp program is for. So the bootcamp program is a full-time, eight-week, super intensive program, which by the end of it, you are going to be work ready as a junior developer. Um, unfortunately, the closest place to do this program right now is in Toronto, um, but we're hopeful that there may be an opportunity in the future for this to be run in London, but um, for now, we're just focusing on the intro course. Um, and like I said, perhaps entrepreneurs who want to get their beta ready um, just want to have a really basic understanding of app development and have things to be able to fiddle with and develop on their own. So that's kind of it in a snapshot. I will be here if you have any questions. There's also an email on that postcard, so feel free to follow up with any questions. Um, and there's a lot of information on the website, which is where Kathleen pulled these details from. So thanks for having me, and we're happy to be able to sponsor with you that you asked tonight. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to mention something quickly. Um, I went to the intro that you had a couple weeks ago and got to speak to some of the students that went through that uh, program um, that you were mentioning that's in Toronto. And they showed like some of the work that they did afterwards. And they're both now working in the tech industry. And it was just really inspiring to see that. So it's nice to see that um, that type of uh, learning is coming to, to London. So. Yeah, I actually went to the HTML 500. Oh, yeah? It was amazing. Like, the program was so approachable that they had like, a 12 year old boy and that, you know, yeah. oh. that beautiful. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Carolyn's already signed up. Oh, did you? Good. Present face in the group. If anyone else is signed up, Um. So as always, you know, I like to put this slide in here. A big thank you to you guys. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we wouldn't be able to have this group without you, so um, I really appreciate it. And Ashley reminded me today that um, I, this month or next month marks our six, uh, six month anniversary. So that's very exciting. So we wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys, so thank you. Um, also, as you're, uh, as you're aware, we have the hashtag uh, LTUXLBT. So as we we're going through any other presentations, if you want to hashtag it, feel free. We always love to see the experience uh, of our meetups from your perspective. So now I want to show you guys some highlights from uh, the workshop that we did last weekend. Take a look at our Twitter. Um, can see some different things that we did. So um, we went through, Ashley put together um, a workshop uh, and some slides that took us through a, like the Google Ventures design sprints. And so basically it's like a set of different steps that you need to do in order to come out with um, like a workable prototype to solve a problem. Oh, sorry guys. So we ended up forming two different teams, and uh, Infotech Research Group sponsored this. So they came up with a design challenge for us. And the design challenge was, um, how can we make uh, Netflix more user-centric on tablet? So that's kind of the challenge that we had set up for ourselves. And uh, the whole day, we um, went through the different steps and uh, ended up we go through like mapping and sketching and really trying to understand the problem, voting on different um, ideas that people have sketched and deciding to go, deciding what we want to focus on and then finish with a workable prototype that we actually user tested. We had, um, we made sure the people from Infotech didn't see um, what we were working on until the end. We had them come in and test out and give us feedback, which was really awesome. Um, I'll just show you guys the pictures. His doing the deciding phase, just looking through different sketches and doing voting. This is the usability text. So we had um, the text set up in one room and then we streamed it over on another TV where we could hear um, the participant go through the text and give feedback. 
which I think is a really powerful um, activity to get feedback on your work. There's Nina prototyping. And so we use sketch and envision to build our prototypes. Team one doing some deciding as well. Actually looking very serious. <laughs> there's another step here that there's um, like inspiration gathering and that's what they're going through like right now in that picture. So overall it was a really uh, fun event and it was our very first workshop. So we hope to have some more in the future. Does anyone have any questions about it? No? Okay. Lost my mouse. All right, so now I'm going to share with you guys um, uh, some of my findings from going over to the Smashing Pump um, just a little while ago. So, um, I've mentioned that I'm a co-founder ladies that you know, but if you uh, aren't aware, I also work at London with my fuzzy website architect. So um, I was really lucky my work ended up sending me um, kind of uh, out of my everyday to uh, New York for this conference um, to just absorb as much information as I could. Now, um, in return for this, I have to present my findings at work to about a hundred people at one of our town halls. So it's basically like, um, you know, uh, I love Smashing Magazine. I think they're like a really great publication. I've followed them for years. I've always wanted to go to New York. And then it's like, but you're gonna have like a hundred eyes looking at you and you need to be able to try to explain everything that you, you got from that. Um, but really, uh, I want, like, I love uh, Smashing Magazine so much that that w it was no question. I wanted to go. And um, so I want to share with you guys something. So I have a vision board. I know it's really cheesy, but, like, I just think this is proof of, like, how these things, like, just manage to work themselves out. So um, I had, like, this idea that I wanted to become a U.S. expert and I wanted to start doing public speaking and I also wanted to go on a trip to New York and then that's just kind of the opportunity that like landed on me for going to this so I just thought that was really interesting so as soon as that came up it was like well this is on the vision board so I must say yes I, I have to like ignore the fact that there's going to be a hundred people that I'm going to have to share it with. Um, so for, with, for anyone that's not familiar with what Smashing Magazine is, it's a digital publication that is for web designers and developers. And so every year they put on various conferences um, throughout the world. So the one that I happened to go to was in New York. And at these conferences, they just um, want to get everyone together to talk about what's happening and what's upcoming in the realm of tech, uh, art, design, and development. So for me, as an attendee, I had the chance to send questions uh, to the speakers uh, while the conference was happening. Um, and they always did a Q&A after each uh, presentation. Um, and I even got the chance to um, chat it up with one of the uh, speakers um, at the after party that they had, which was really cool. Um, I ended up pulling up a site that we had worked on and he gave me a little critique on it and told me what he liked about it and gave us gave me like some advice on how we can improve it, which is really cool. And like that's one of the things about conferences is at Smashing Conf, what they did, they recorded them all and so we will be able to go and check out those talks. But it's a little bit different when you're able to actually physically go to the conference and just like immerse yourself in in like learning more about your craft and being able to talk to different people and things like that. So like one of my favorite things about it is of course networking <laughs> with uh, the Frozen characters. So that was a really funny thing that I had happen to me. I wanted to go check out what um, Times Square looked like and then all of a sudden out of nowhere these characters came up and took my iPhone and I didn't know what was happening and they took a picture of me and then they asked me for a tip. 
And I only had twenty dollars on me, so that was a very expensive photo. <laughs> I must have really looked like a tourist there. Um, but really, so my favorite part about the conference was just meeting people outside of my regular circle um, and hearing about the tools that they're using to do their job and what they're using to work with their teams, um, what challenges they're facing, and how they're trying to overcome them. So I met many Americans while I was there, and I also even met a few Canadians um, in person. And then there was also talk, uh, like speakers, like internationally from all different places. Um, so that was really neat. Now, before the conference, I wanted to go there with like an intention. Um, these are the questions that I came up with that I wanted to have at the back of my mind. Uh, to make the best of the trip, I thought I need to be able to answer these questions. So like, what am I going to be able to take from this to make it so this conference is like a success for me and for my team since I'm bringing this information back to them? Um, and like, what's going to make it worth it besides just giving like a free trip to New York, right? So um, these were the questions I wanted to answer to make it worthwhile. And I'm going to circle back to them. Um, at the end and let you know how I kind of answered them. So, okay, does anyone here know Chelsea Handler? And if you don't, then you're going to be like, what is, so Chelsea Handler is a comedian and she has a show on Netflix. And on Netflix, she uh, has this guy, uh, DJ, um, uh, DJ Collab, or a uh, public Huh? DJ Khaled. Khaled, thank you. So DJ Khaled has these major keys, and like he has this phrase, major key alert. So I thought it was pretty funny, I, and I always loved watching him and like he share like, as he, as you can see here, he has like major key alerts, and they're usually consisting of working hard and never giving, giving up on your dreams. So I thought I'd sum up the major keys that I got from uh, Smashing Conference. So. Kathleen's uh, Smashing Home Major Keys. The first one was experiment. So this idea of trying to make something just for the sake of seeing if it can be done. The next one was putting ideas out into the world to make them a reality. And like that kind of like that idea of the vision board is that, a, is that same like notion. And you'll see it in these different talks that I'll go over how that is one of the major keys that I got from it. Um, designing for the web is hard. Like this major key was like a validation for me because it is hard. And like sometimes great experiences can be like a list of contradictions. And um, I'll dive more into that when I talk about the talk that went over that. Um, a great customer experience starts with a work environment that is actually going to allow the team and the players of that team to succeed. And the last major key that I got from it was that London, Ontario is actually doing pretty darn good. So major key number one, experiment. Oops. So the speaker, um, Brandon Dawes, he, this is a quote from him, he said, he started getting annoyed when he saw how people were treating each other on Twitter. Um, and how that sometimes people forget that there's an actual human on the other side. And so he, he did an experiment, he made a machine. And that machine is this, it's the happiness machine. So I wanna show you guys this. Has anyone seen this before? Okay. So what this machine is, is anytime you press this button, anything that's like tagged with happiness, it prints it out on this little like receipt. 
that you can just kind of pull off and like carry it around with you. Um, it's like just an experiment that he tried out. And what he found was like people fell in love with this experiment. So it, all it really is is just like a printer connected to the internet. So it's just kind of like a fax machine. But the difference here is, you know, the form of it, um, how it's just this little piece of paper that you can kind of pull off and put in your pocket. And the, the other idea is like, so with the tweets that we see, it's like not a physical object. You're like looking at it like on a screen. Where here, he's talking about like, um, well, I think I got ahead of myself. The first thing is it's like a really simple concept, right? It's like hooking the internet up to a printer. But then adding that emotional connection about being able to print off like happy messages from people, he's basically wrapped it in um, the concept around and made it something really special that resonated with people. And the fact that you're able to pull this thing off and hold it in your hands, like when you're able to actually physically hold something, especially with your hands, you like fall in love with it. Like, do you notice people holding their phones, sometimes they're like caressing them and just like you, you, like, you fall in love with it, like you get to hold on to it. So that was a big thing. Um, and this other idea of like putting your ideas out there and you may be surprised who's gonna love your work. So another, what ended up happening was this idea of this happiness machine got picked up and like was put on different expeditions and like in museums and became really popular. And one of his favorite pictures um, that he had while it was like on display was like these um, like older German like women looking at it. They weren't able to like read English, but they just were like so fascinated by it. And they were like hanging around this machine for like 15 minutes. And he never would have expected them to be like his his audience. Um, but another thing happened as well. Um, Airbnb ended up hearing about this idea that he came up with, and they loved it. And what they asked him to do, they ended up commissioning him and asking him to come up with something so that their audience would be able to share stories with them. And when they first came up with to him about this idea. Like, and remember guys, this all just started with an experiment. He wanted to see if he would be able to like connect these links to a printer. Um, and now he has Airbnb coming up to him and asking him to develop this for him. So when they first did, they were like, he said to them, we can't just have people sending these stories in. And we're gonna need someone to like filter them and make sure like, like what if somebody writes something bad? And Airbnb was like, yeah, it's fine. Like, no worries. And so they had like, Thousands of messages come in and they only had one like negative thing that came out of it. So like that's pretty impressive. And it's like just showing like, you know, trusting people. <laughs> we're not all like, you know, we're not all that. <laughs> so I thought that was really cool. So that's one idea for experimentation. Um, then this other one was from Sarah uh, Dra Drasner. I'm really bad with last names. So, um, she started doing some experimentation with SVG uh, animation. So that's another one I want to share with you guys. So this is all SVG images that she's worked with here. So you can click on different elements and different things happen. And she's just been kind of experimenting with this idea and testing it out. But what I thought was really cool about this, this experimentation that she's done, she didn't just, she took it one step further and she's actually made it responsive. And it still works. You still have the little bear coming out. Like 
that, depending on the size of a dress. And that's crazy. <laughs> How did she do that? <coughs> so what she recommended, what she started using, I'm not sure is anyone familiar with this uh, green stock? I hadn't heard of it before. Oh, okay, so Emily's familiar with it. So it's a timeline-based animation tool. Um, so, and I've also included Sarah's slides here, so I'm going to share this slide so that you guys will be able to like download this stuff or, and get the links and everything. But um, in Sarah's slide, she actually goes through and, and explains the technologies that she's using and kind of gives you like a demo so you're actually able to test it out. I'm super excited about this. So um, my role now at London Life is um, like an interaction designer, not doing code so much anymore. But when I saw this, I was like, I need to get back in there. And I need to start playing with this because this is really exciting. So that's what I'm going to be doing. That's one of my takeaways from um, the conference is experimenting with this SVG animation. Um, and then the next one, that the next talk that really resonated with me was um, the physical interface from Josh, Josh Clark. And I have a link there to his uh, talk. But I just took a couple things from it. Um, so we had a t we looked at that a happiness machine and how it's like this physical object, right? It's like connecting the web with a physical object, kind of like the um, like I IoT Internet of Things. <laughs> so that whole idea. So he talked about like how the web is no longer just a browser. Like this is huge. Like we're seeing um, like. The way we're interacting with the web is changing, and we don't want to get like we, we need to realize that this is happening, and we should be experimenting with it and playing with it and just trying things out. Um, and one of the things I loved about like everyone talking about these things is like just try the experiments out, and the function, the practical function of it, is just going to come. Like for example, that happiness machine. Like you just tried it out, and then he ended up getting like Airbnb to sign him on or like Sarah how she just all she was doing was just she's really pas passionate about animation and uh, trying different technologies out and was able to come up with that really awesome like responsive animation so um, what ended up being introduced in this um, talk was this idea of like I'm not sure I don't think they have it here in Canada but like Amazon has these like buttons that you can buy and you can they actually connect to your account. So in this example here, there's a tag button, and when you run out of tag, you can just click it, and it's going to connect to your account and send you tag. And like that's pretty incredible. Um, and so it became so popular that they ended up making this button that you can buy, and you can actually like decide what it's going to link up to. And so what he suggested was hooking it up to if this then that. Is everyone familiar with that app? So if you buy these two things, you can kind of like connect them together. And this is like an invent inventor kit. You're able to like come up with an idea of how, what you want to happen when you push that button, just like that happiness machine. Like all it is is just hooking it up to a link so you can come up with whatever recipe you want and kind of experiment with that. I think that's really because you don't need to know too much code for this one. Like, just try it out and try to figure out how you can play with this physical interface. Um, he also shared with us the physical web. Has anyone seen this video? Okay, it's a it's a, like an older video, and I hadn't seen it before, and I thought it was super super cool. <laughs> And I'm not going to share the whole video, just the beginning of it. <coughs> I'm kind of sad. I don't think you guys are going to be able to hear it very well. Looking movie. When's the next showing? Can you guys hear it okay? No, you might have to come closer. <laughs> There's a title. That's a good idea. <laughs> Great-looking movie. When's the next showing? Yeah. Nowadays, nearly everyone 
because the internet in their pocket can access the world's information at their fingertips. However, getting and interacting with that information isn't always easy. So where did I put that barcode scanner? I can never, I... Barcode scanner. The barcode scanner? Yeah. However, if you believe in Moore's Law at all, you can project that there are going to be millions of smart devices in our homes, in our work, and everywhere in between. Accessing functionality from these devices can be just like using the web. You just walk up, tap, and go. Cool, let me show in just a few minutes. Hello, I'm Scott Jensen. So, how does this work? The poster is using a Bluetooth low energy beacon to broadcast the URL every second. The device here can run for five years on a single charge. There's a simple scanner on the phone that looks around whenever you wake it up. It won't do any scanning if the phone is in your pocket. The user must always ask to see if anything is nearby. If the scanner discovers something, it'll give you a list to choose from, write and filter to reduce spam, and bring the most relevant content to the top. You select the web page and it opens, just like clicking on a search result. So that's pretty cool, like being able to have these little devices, these little detectors around our environment. And um, so the, the link is there so you can continue taking a look, but it's just like thinking about the web much differently than, you know, outside of that screen that we've kind of come accustomed to it being there. Um, so that's just kind of like the idea I was talking about here is the way we interact with the web is changing. And we should experiment so we don't get lost behind. Like, just like print, like it's still there. And um, I, I think that, you know, we're never going to stop having screens that we should be interacting with. Like, we're probably, I don't know if we're going to lose those, or it's probably going to take some time for that to kind of go away. But um, we're coming to this era where, like, these, like, um, we have like augmented reality. Um, Ashley's going to be talking about um, conversational UX. Like people are interacting with the web much differently now, and now's the time to start experimenting with it and, and trying out this stuff. And um, you know, there's there's so much that we're going to be able to do with it. And starting early and just playing around with it is huge. So that's the one thing is that's the one major key is just experiment. Yeah. So that was the, that, those major keys were a little bit longer. These ones are a little bit shorter. So the second one is put an idea out into the world to make it a reality. So one of the really cool things about um, at Smashing Conference is they have these mystery speakers. Well, they have, yeah, they have two. They'll have like the M MC, they don't reveal who that's gonna be and it's usually a celebrity and like a celebrity code person or design person. And then they also have a speaker. So the person that they had on the second day was um, Seb Lester. Now he's, um, if you're ever on Instagram or maybe just like on YouTube, he's one of those artists, like a calligraphy artist, that will do those really cool videos of like different type design. Um, and he also started out like years ago, like I think it's like 30 years ago or so, doing just, uh, uh, he's a type designer. So he talked about how he, his talk was really neat because he went through like his career path and um, he didn't have his uh, slides shared, so I'm sorry I can't show you like his whole career path, but one of the things that he was always working on was um, like techie font. He really wanted his font to be on a spaceship someday, and he would draw that out and um, put it out into the world, and like he showed us really funny pictures of like the idea that he had for this typeface was to be on a, air, like a spaceship, and then it turned out like on a Doritos day. <laughs> oh, and then like he showed like these awesome examples of like the, his typeface being used on like beautiful design posters. And then it being like just kind of like hacked together on like this like really terrible design. And I thought that was so interesting how like a type designer's work is like everywhere and it might not be used how they intended. But that whole idea, like his whole career always Keeping that in mind, how he wanted to um, to have something on a spaceship, and he also wanted to be known. He found that like he had a very popular font that people were using. I'm sorry, I don't know what the name of it was. But when he would meet other type designers and stuff, they didn't know who he was. So that's when he started doing these videos and trying to like really like kind of make become like a rock star of it. 
And through that, he ended up getting an email um, from NASA one day, like asking him if it, he, he could like quote on um, making a, mich a mission logo for them. So he ended up, he had a guy that he um, would get quotes from. And so he sent him a note saying like, is this going to be like this, like trying to describe what this is and how it's going to be on like a satellite that's orbiting the earth. And like, does this count as like, um, like, uh, like a global like license or, and the guy was just like, this is like by far like the craziest thing I've had to quote on. But they ended up working out a price. And um, so this is the logo that he came up with. He showed some different like experiments and different ideas that he was first working with for it. And what ended up happening was he made a mission badge for them. So the astronauts would be wearing these and it would appear in a bunch of different places. And one of the places that it appeared was a spaceship. And so I thought that was so cool. Like he just had this vision and like people were asking him like how, like, how did you do it? And he was just saying, I just worked really hard. Like I had my idea of what I wanted and I just kept working to get there. And, you know, he didn't just keep it to himself. He put that idea out there into the world so that he's able to actually make it happen. So the next major key is designing for the web is hard. So this talk um, from Espen, uh, does anyone know how to say that? <laughs> from Espen, um, was really great. It was this idea of the secret life of comedy. So I have his, uh, you can download his talk in the slide, but what I'm just going to highlight here is you have this idea of like how great great design and like really uh, usable design is fast, universal, intuitive, it's like invisible, you don't really notice it's there, it's user centric, and it's scientific. But good design is also can be kind of slow it's individual, it's like personal, it surprises you, it's impressive instead of invisible, it's visionary, and it's artistic. And what we end up finding is we end up having like these debates, and I find them at sometimes um, on the team that I'm on. Like, visual designers are trying to be like really creative with their ideas of like how they want the web page to flow. Like maybe um, they they want to have like a masonry <laughs> a pattern, but that kind of breaks like the readability of it, but it makes it more unique, so you're not having this cookie cutter thing. Or and then like the interaction designers want it to be like very very um, uh, like using common patterns and being easy to understand and intuitive, but. So you end up having like this battle of like, should it be really fancy or do we need to make sure it's like really usable? And his idea here was like, instead of doing this versus, like it can be both. And like, that was like a big thing for me. Like we have a really hard job of trying to, trying to balance these two things out. And um, an example he gave of like how it can be both, I thought was really neat. So there's this website here. I guess I didn't put the link in. So he talks about like how as web designers, we, we're really like storytellers. We're, we're, we have like a narrative that we're trying to express to the people that are looking at our work. So, so stories are different. Sometimes, um, sometimes you're kind of being led into something or sometimes like stories can be different. It can be like, um, you know, you have, you get to the point quickly. Like, for example, if I'm talking about like um, Star Wars, I could just tell you the plot, but, and that's telling you the story. Or I can, or if we sit down and we go through the movie, it's instead of it just being like, okay, like, I don't know, like a straight line like this, it's like it varies and you have ups and downs and you have elements of surprise and things like that. So, for example, on this web page, um, there's, it's like telling you a story. You don't go straight into what this product is, 
it's like really explaining like um, what these different stones are, how they do the process, and like making you kind of have to scroll through and read and discover on your own. They have visual like video in the background and things like that. But when it comes down to actually needing to act, this material selector, you know, it becomes more intuitive. You're, you're, it's starting to come and have these like regular patterns that you normally see. But as well, it's like this, it's not doing like, um, like just like a column with the product and then clicking into it will give you more, they do, give you more details. They're doing it in like a different way that's still intuitive. Like you click, you're able to click on here, get more details on it. Um, like they're kind of, think, they're breaking the mold, but it's not, it's nothing too, too extreme. You're still able to use it. And it's responsive. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting example that he gave. So that whole idea of trying to balance really creative work with something usable. So the next major key is number four. So designing great customer experiences starts with your work environment. So this whole idea is your work environment must allow the team and the players to succeed. You have to really try to build a friendly, positive, and open culture. So the speaker here, and I'll share it, I'll add it, because I didn't add it. Sorry, I missed it in the slides. But she had like this kind of formula on how she thinks you can get to this collaborative um, environment. So she talks about sharing UX. So this is that idea of like actually going through and seeing what the user experience is like for the people that you're designing, like having empathy. So she had this example. So she works for the UK government. and. One of the things that needed to be done if you were sick and needed to get assistance was you had to like have a wet signature in order to get the money that you needed. But if you really sit down and like go through what that's like, it's like they're already really sick. They could be in the hospital um, going through a really difficult time and they might not even be able to, they, they need assistance to have them help them get that wet signature. And wouldn't it be just so much easier if they could just have that done online and not have to have like loved ones trying to put this together for them. And so it's really like um, that idea of being, um, having empathy and understanding the problem uh, that users are facing. And what they ended up doing was, that was like a business process that they needed to change, but they actually shared that, um, that scenario with the people that needed to make those decisions so they understand the problem and can help improve it. Um, the next one was stay honest. And this means just like be simple and be clear and like kind of cut all the, the fluff out of things. Um, then she also talks about research as a team sport. So I have a slide for that. So, So it's like that idea of like usability testing and like being like sharing your findings with your team and being transparent and letting everyone see what the user is really going through. She also had this idea of playing in the same field. And like this is a common theme I've been seeing so often about like that idea of like pair design and like working with other people outside your role. So in this example here, she has um, a designer and a front end developer working together. And then this idea I really loved, this share and celebrate. So these are like mission badges, um, just like that typeset designer, um, how he actually did one for NASA. But they have this idea of like, for every project that people in, at the UK government are working on, they have these little badges that they can actually, they print off and they put them on stickers that you can like, they'll have on their uh, computers. And um, just getting people excited about the work that they're doing. I thought that was really cool. And so the last major key that I took from this is that like London, Ontario is doing really good. Um, let's see if I, 
like we're amazingly blessed to live here going to that conference in new york and being able to speak to other people in the industry around the world um some of the people that i talk to don't have like this type of environment around them like we have the dev london uh, community we have ux talks uh, explode conference like explode conference was the first conference i'd ever been able to go to besides one that i went to in toronto and like it was comparable to the um the smashing conference i would so i thought that was really positive we have ladies and kids learning code dribble meetup and we just have more and more like we have um dribble meetups and um wordpress and stuff like that so i just wanted to like take a moment and be like we're doing really good as a city and we're just getting better so i just want to like say let's continue to grow our community of tech design and user experience folks um so the last thing was okay she had all those questions how did she answer these questions i have all this exciting stuff happening on the screen <laughs> So, you know, we only have a certain amount of time to, like, for me to try to sum up these two days. So I'm going to end up writing an article and trying to really uh, sum up everything so that you can go and check out these different links and stuff. But one of, the, one, one of the talks that really hit home for me, and if I tried to go into it today, I wouldn't have been able to get through it, was from um, Ala. And I have a link to her talk there. And it was all around design systems. And she's basically taken that idea of atomic design to a, like a whole nother level. And she's basically made it like a collaborative effort with your team. So you would have like your content people in the room with you, um, front end developers, visual designers, working through these different design patterns so that you end up coming up with like a common language and the design pattern doesn't get forgotten. She even talks about like um, how her team has like a Slack bot that will actually remind them of common patterns, um, like of, of patterns in their library so you don't forget about them. Um, and they also have a whole channel just dedicated to naming these patterns because having a whole team involved is just gonna make it so people um, use the language and use the system so how might we be able to work more effectively and collaboratively i think the answer is doing those design systems collaboratively um, what kind of deliverables are other teams using to communicate designs to devs um, i should add design systems there too because but i i learned about this app called uh, frontify which is really cool for design it's like a super easy way to make uh, style guides. Has anyone heard of Frontify? It's really cool. I had never heard of it, so I checked it out, and it's like a CMS for uh, front end, for style guides and pattern libraries. It's like super simple, so that's one thing. Um, I ended up meeting a girl there that also works at an, an insurance company, which is what I work at, and that was one of the tools she said her team loves to use, as well as a workspace, which is part of uh, Frontify. Um, but also, if you have a really good design system, you're no longer going to have to have like these really high fidelity um, mock-ups with like the perfect spacing and everything because you already have those patterns in place. Now you're going to be able to just give a dev like a rough wireframe and they're going to already know what the specs are for it. Um, so that's also another way to like make the, del the, del the del deliverables that you're giving to the, the devs like super easy. Um, how might we better be able to communicate our work to the team and stakeholders? Um, that whole idea of like design, um, pair design that we went through, um, and design sprints, and just making sure that you're sharing your work often. Like, don't just get the information from the stakeholder and don't talk to them for a couple months. Like, always be checking in and sharing and showing them. Um, the next one is how are how are other teams working with the business to keep their vision and goals in mind for improving the UX? One of the big talks that I really liked that I wasn't able to cover was this quote, um, was from a girl from um, Mailchimp. She did a talk on uh, writing for every day, but she also shared they have a voice and tone guide that were, 
we've actually open source that you can download and customize for your company. So that's really cool. Um, and then also, I think, just that whole design system. Like, uh, I think that's huge, and that's going to answer a bunch of these questions. Um, how might we be able to implement a pattern library at the start of a website redesign? Um, when I asked Alo just like on Twitter, like how can we do this from the beginning? She was like, we just need to get everyone together early so you guys can be collaborating and talking about it and starting to like identify what patterns you need. So yeah, so those are my th th those are how I answered the questions. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to put together uh, a little write up with all the different links. Like this is just scratching the surface of, um, of smashing comp. And I want to mention something. For some reason, they gave us these stickers that say "I love Flexbox," and I wonder if you were, <laughs> as a friend of developer, if you're wondering about uh, Flexbox. Um, but there was no mention of Flexbox at the whole conference, so I'm not sure what that was all about. But I decided to look into it, and I found like this. Um, if you, if that was something that you were interested in, does anyone know about Flexbox? Okay, okay. So you guys might not find it that interesting then. Um, but web. They have like a really. Have you seen Webflow's like example of it? No. Maybe. So this is Webflow. What they've done is they've made this like interactive um, like demo of hmm. oh, okay. They make this game to teach you how Flexbox works. So anyway, I can't see it very good. So you can kind of play with this. They have these different settings here. So you have the point of the game is to try to get them in the right spot. But it's like a visual way of seeing how your layout is going to work. And I thought that was really neat. So you might be interested in checking it out. And that's it. So thank you guys. Thank you. Now on to Ashley's awesome talk. Now, or we're going to have a little break? Yes. I would just okay. do like a five, ten minute break. If anyone wants to call themselves with the main clicker, there's so much food left. Um, there's water in front of me, or you can get a drink. And there's washers just around the corner at the hall to your left, if anyone wants to take a quick break. And then we'll start back up around 10 to 2 or whatever.
say that uh, last call for the lovely kitchen if anyone would like to get a drink or take uh, any snacks I'm just gonna get started here in a minute um, but uh, help yourself there's still lots of food and uh, we'll be packing it up soon so if you'd like anything just help yourself Everyone see? There's some hot front row seats in there. <laughs> Did you mind watching the live stream? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, cool. I'm going to get started uh, just because I know it is the day before the long weekend. So, poor planning on our part, but thank you for being good sports <laughs> and joining us. Um, so, I'm going to talk today about, uh, I guess, what's being called in the industry conversational UX. Um, but you might be more familiar with the term of bots and uh, this idea of being able to message each other and talk to bots. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on and uh, wrap things up by giving you a quick demo on how you could potentially build your own bot. Um, so uh, that'll be kind of an exciting talk. Um, and feel free to jump in if you have any questions. Uh, it's a small group here tonight, so uh, just uh, let us know if you wanted to clarify or, or talk a little bit more about something. So uh, there's recently been a huge shift in how customers are using technology. Um, I think it's really important to just kind of stop and take a moment to take this in. Uh, for the first time ever, people are now using messaging apps more than they are using social media. So. We know that people use social media a lot. Like the number of times you probably check Facebook or Twitter or you use um, one of those sites like Instagram uh, to see what's going on. Um, it's a lot. People, you're on them all the time. I think I actually installed uh, one of those 
time tracking apps on your phone that tells you how long that you've been on your phone that that day and like which apps you're using the most. And I was horrified. Like I thought it was malfunctioning at one point, but it was not. <laughs> uh, and we use social media channels a lot. So the idea that people are using messaging apps more than social media, this is just like an incredible concept to try to wrap your head around. Um, to put it into more perspective, uh, this is a chart that Business Insider put together. They have a white paper on this topic. It's really interesting to read. Um, but they wanted to demonstrate kind of like the rise of messaging apps and how uh, big of an impact that they're having on people. So this line here, this darker line, um, is social networking. So like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like that sort of thing. And uh, you can see that it has steadily grown. Um, this chart here is like quarterly. So from 2011 to 2015, you can see that social media is absolutely on the rise. So when people are like, oh, I don't know if Facebook's going to be a thing, like, yeah, it's definitely still a thing and it's continuing to grow, but not at the rate that messaging apps are growing. If you look at the, the way that messaging app usage is like exponentially growing and surpassing social media, you can see how quickly it is about to just like completely overtake that from a sense of how many people are using it. And it's just such just a wild thing to just maybe wrap your head around. Um, for those of you who are, use messaging apps a lot, and I'm going to talk a bit about what those are, um, maybe it's not, about, but for an older demographic or for those of us who maybe don't, aren't on some of these networks, like, it's, it's crazy to think that something could be potentially outtaking social media networks this much. Uh, so when we talk about messaging apps, what do we mean? Uh, here's the selection of the global leaders in the market today. Uh, so some of us are probably familiar with you know, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. Uh, in China, Japan, Korea, WeChat, Line, and I, not, I don't know how to pronounce that, I think it's Keiko Talk. Um, they're, they're, these are the global leaders in the messaging app space right now. And when we talk about that, like we're saying, some of these uh, platforms, I just saw a more recent number from Facebook Messenger where they're almost approaching a billion active monthly users per month. So this number here, uh, the 100 mm, that's 100 million monthly active users using the platform. So there is like a huge potential um, from a business perspective when you're looking at this to think about how many customers are in this space using these apps every day, every month. It's just kind of crazy to wrap your head around. When you look at that, you know, I think the important thing to take away is that um, as, and as uh, Kathleen was mentioning earlier, it's important to stay on top of what's happening in the industry and to realize that the internet is not just the web browser. I love that quote, by the way. I think I tweeted it for Lays at UX. Um, if we can stay on top of what's happening, it helps us to think a little differently about our work and the different ways that we can reach customers and the different ways that we can reach users um, and what we can experiment with. And uh, I think this is when people start to talk about um, some of those apps that you know somewhat innovating in the space like Uber and Airbnb and Netflix, you know, people are like, wow, like they just totally changed things. And when I think about it, I don't really know that they necessarily have. They're still providing the same services that we've, we've always had. Like people still get in a car to take a taxi to go somewhere. People still are watching entertainment through some sort of device. But what those companies are doing really differently is that they were understanding how people are using technology and what's going on and where they're spending their time. And they're using that to be the differentiator in what they're providing. So to think about it in that perspective just kind of makes you realize that, and as you can see from the, the, the way that it, these uh, type, this type of technology is being used, this is truly like the next phase of the internet and how people are going to be interacting with each other and new types of technology because of that. So uh, why, do we, why do we think this is happening? Well, there's a, there's a trend um, and that is the researchers are starting to notice and app developers have probably really started to notice, which is that um, app fatigue is starting to settle in. So if you put, just put your hand up if you downloaded you know, five apps this month and you're using them. Three apps, three new apps that you downloaded this month and you're using one hand. <laughs> Two apps, yeah. People just aren't doing it anymore. Um, it's we're starting to get used to these uh, ecosystems where uh, we want instant 
frictionless access to everything. I want to mention that my daughter video games all the time. Video games. Okay, so it's a little different. Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense though. But um, when we talk about apps that like do one specific thing, like a calculator or you know an app for your bank or um, something like that, we're just not downloading them as much anymore. And when we look at how people are starting to interact with the digital world around them, there are all these almost like ecosystems that we've started to belong to. So you think about like Google or Amazon, for example, you create a Google account and they've created an entire world that you can be a part of because you have that one account. So you can create slide decks with Google Docs, you can use Google Word to type up documents, you can watch YouTube videos and save them to watch later, you can check your email all with one account, all from really one place because of the way that they've created that whole experience. And what's really interesting is that um, investors are starting to notice that. When we look at where all of the money of startups and products started to become invested, uh, in Silicon Valley last year. It was all in messaging apps like Snapchat and Kik and some of the other ones that I showed you before. Um, because what we're starting to realize is this is where our customers are spending their time. So how can we leverage that to create new interactions and to be there where our customers are and where users are interacting with each other? And that's where bots are really starting to play a big role. Um, and it's not just uh, as a fad or a gimmick, but it's, it's really with really unique interactions using this and leveraging this type of technology. And I'm going to show you um, a video about what bots are, if you're not familiar. Um, and it's not these type of bots. So I'm just going to uh, bring us up quickly. And okay. Is it going to try to put closed captioning on. Isn't that complicated? Bots are like people, but they're not actually people, they're computers. See, you just open a conversation the same way you would when you're talking to a friend, but instead of a person, it's a bot. They make robots. Bots. bots. <laughs> not robots, bots. They're like super smart apps you can talk to. Like, if you wanted to know if it was going to rain tomorrow, you'd probably ask Dad. Dad probably wouldn't know, but a weather bot would know right away. And it wouldn't just tell you the weather, it could send you a forecast every morning when you wake up. Dad would never do that. Or let's say you wanted to tell a joke in a group of friends, but you aren't funny. But I am funny. You could just get the bot to come up with something funny for you. But the bot wouldn't get the credit, you won't. Anyway, bots can do Pretty much anything. They can remind you to do things, play a game with you, send you a funny video, tell you a story. They're like an awesome friend who never ignores your text. What's that one? Kickbots. Smart, useful, and clearly fun for everyone. Mom, give me my phone back. <laughs> it's talking to me. So every instance of box is actually bots. <laughs> um, but it was interesting in that video when I first watched it, um, there's a lot of similarities to, to the type of uh, experiences that we're used to right now. Like if you looked at that one frame um, here, it just kind of looks similar to the app store. Um, but there, what I think is really interesting and brilliant is that um, people are experimenting and creating with this technology in a way that um, they're trying to think through, okay, people are using these apps to talk to each other and they're spending so much time here, what else can we do with this? Um, and there's not a lot of bots out there yet, um, but there are some really interesting ones and I'm just going to give a few examples. So yeah, like I mentioned, uh, this entire new um, way of bringing them into these messaging apps. Bots, what's interesting is that bots aren't really anything new. If you've ever been on an internet forum and uh, you said something that wasn't part of the rules and you got kicked out of the forum automatically, um, or if you posted a comment somewhere and it maybe had a link in it um, and that wasn't allowed and it was banned, um, that's technically a bot. It's something that's scanning something that's going on or it's something triggered something else and then it uh, created a reaction. 
Um, but what's different about these type of bots is that they're way more intelligent. Um, so like at Facebook, if you followed the release uh, in April, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, they've been creating an entire platform where when you talk to one of these bots, and I'm just going to show you um, some examples here, that they actually talk back with you like a real human. And they're making that technology freely available for everyone to use. Um, so here's a few examples that Facebook showed at the FA conference in April when they were trying to kind of show like the, the realm of the possible with, with creating these bots in apps. And this is the Facebook Messenger app. So if you've ever used Facebook to send someone a message through Facebook, um, this is the same platform. But what's happening here is that instead of messaging your friend, when you search for a name within the, within the app, you can actually search for like your favorite brand or for a store or any business that's on the Facebook platform and has a Facebook page. If it has a bot, you'll notice this uh, little symbol that looks like the chat icon over the avatar. And uh, then you can just start talking to it like you would a person. And this is uh, here, I think this is a clothing store. Um, so they're actually talking in this picture uh, to the bot, and they said, like, I want to see a black shirt, um, and then it showed them a few examples, and then they ordered it, um, and they wanted to know if they could also buy it in a different color, and then it's talking to them like a real person. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, of course, your total will be $43. Do you want us to place the order? Um, so instead of having to try to click around an interface and figure out how to, to put things in your shopping cart and then how to check out and how to order, you're just talking to the bot like you would a person. And then I uh, hear the person asks the bot, like, oh, where is my order? Like, when will I get it? And the bot's like, oh, don't worry. It's on the way. It should arrive on Monday. Here's a map. Um, and here's a link if you want to see like the further details. Uh, so it, it's, it's pretty uh, amazing like how you can interact with these te this technology. And it feels so human-like um, within the messaging app platform. This is another API um, that is currently out there. They've been a little quieter, but um, this is Pasisto. And uh, they are working with banks and financial institutions. And I was just reading an article, I think it's Wells Fargo, um, is about to come out with a banking uh, chatbot. And again, this is Facebook Messenger, but using that technology platform. And uh, it, they're just talking to the bot like it's uh, a person. So what was my largest junk food transaction? Like that's, that's the person asking the bot. <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh yeah, sure, here it is. Like here's how much it cost. It was Shake Shack, you spent $30 um, on this state. And I was like, okay, cool. And uh, here they're asking the bot their balance and uh, you know, just having a conversation. And that it, it's just like they're asking a person or they're calling a bank teller or they're, they're, they're um, phone banking. And you know, maybe at first you don't think this is that interesting but when you realize that this person's already using the messenger app every day like talk to their friends um, or whatever it is and just within seconds they can flip over and start talking to the spot and then go back to their friends um, it, it means that they don't have to download an app it means that they don't have to take up more data and storage on their phone um, they can just start to use this service without really any friction and having to go to the app store and find the app and download it and use it on their phone and remember their password and like all these things. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing like all the things that they do. So today the Apple App Store has about 1.5 million apps. Um, Facebook Messenger already has about, like I said, 900 million active users. I think it's closer to a billion now, like I said. Um, this is over 100 times the number of iPhone users that the Apple App Store had when the iPhone was launched in 2008. So in about eight years, uh, Facebook Messenger already has over uh, 900 million active users, sorry, 100 times the number of iPhone users. Uh, and they've only been, Facebook Messenger, I think, has only been really like forced on users over the last couple of years. Um, so it, it's incredible. and. Uh, even if Facebook only gets approximately 10% of the users to start using Messenger bots, uh, that's actually more than the app, Apple App Store has, and they can match that entire market. And really, like once you start to realize that 
you know, you can order a pizza, you can order an Uber, you can buy a shirt all within the Facebook Messenger app. And you don't have to go to the Apple App Store and download the app for that store or the app for that specific pizza place. Um, I think that the, the potential for people to start using these messenger bots will catch on really quickly, and then we won't even use an Apple App Store anymore. It'll just all be within the system. And some major players are entering this space. So uh, if you're a Ladies at UX Slack member, uh, you probably have interacted with Slack before. Uh, Slack's been using bots for a long time, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of investment happening in that space. Uh, Facebook at their annual conference just met, announced that the official messenger platform beta. So they're basically creating this uh, kit that almost any developer uh, would be able to use and develop their own uh, messenger bot for their business or for themselves, um, which I'm going to show you in a moment. But like I said, very complex interactions possible, almost like right out of the box and the ability to talk to customers using natural language is just table stakes with this platform. Um, and the potential for growth is huge. One other thing I want to mention as well is that what's really great too about this type of development is that when you develop an app right now, you have to think about all the different platforms that you'd want to develop it on. So you have to develop it for iOS and for Android, or maybe um, you're developing Windows apps. Probably pretty, pretty unlikely. But all of these different platforms exist. And they work in different ways, and they have different type of native interactions. What's really interesting about the bot platform is that you just have to get it to work with Facebook Messenger. And then Facebook makes sure that Messenger works on Android and, and iOS and all the different platforms. So it's actually less development work overall, because you're just developing it for this one type of technology. So I just kind of wanted to sum up like why this is potentially such a, like a hot new area. And I think this, this will just grow by leaps and bounds. When we design an interface like this, we do so in the hope that it's intuitive for people. And like uh, Kathleen was mentioning, you know, we, we study style patterns and the way that people look at interfaces. And we try to create that consistent behaviors. So people are able to interact with this. Um, we, you know, we, we look at other websites. We, we gather inspiration and we try to put it together and you know there's different variations of this but almost you know it's it's every single time that someone opens up a new website it's something that they have to learn because like you don't walk outside your front door and see this in nature you know it's not something that we're just naturally able to interpret some of us learn over time because we got used to using the internet all the time but there's constantly new design there's there's new ways that people are putting together interfaces and so People are always having to learn how to use this. The difference and the thing that's so brilliant about bots and conversational UX talking to something is that we all know how to do that. Like every human knows how to have a conversation. So if I gave someone a messaging app and said, just talk to it like you would a person, most people get how to do that. The, the usability is way higher because you don't have to know what the arrow symbol means and that when I click on a drop down that it's going to probably open up a menu and then I can click on another button and it'll take me in somewhere else. Uh, the simplicity is really the beauty of this platform. So I think that uh, just kind of like in summary of why this is uh, you know, such a great opportunity and it's so interesting and challenging for us as designers and developers is that you know, humans don't always behave the way that you think they will. So there's still the research and usability testing has to happen and how, you know, those potential users will interact with the platform. And, uh, you know, even with specific instructions, humans will still do their own thing. <laughs> and I learned this recently through an experiment that I ran when I first started to learn about bots and, and I wanted to know how to make one. Um, and I think that kind of takes us into the second half of my presentation, which is, OK, this is cool. Like, How do I actually start to use this? Because when you see something like this, like, quite often it can seem intimidating. And you know, you're not sure, like, is this something that's in the far future? Or is this something you have a really special skill set in order to develop? Um, and what's really great about this technology is that you know, people are already thinking about ways to get more people to make bots. And Facebook and Kik and all of these platforms, they really want people to learn and, and to start making these so that they become more commonplace and 
people are, are learning how to use them more quickly. And the first place that I really found a good source on how to make a bot was when I encountered Esther Crawford's Esther bot, uh, as you can see at the top there. Um, she's a product marketer, so she didn't really have a background in development or design, um, but she uh, actually was in San Francisco. She had seen this kind of like picking up speed and she wanted to know how to make a bot. And so she did a lot of research and tried to find like a basic way to get started. And uh, she created Esterbot. And I just thought I would show you how it works quickly. So she made the, the bot on uh, two platforms, so Facebook Messenger and Telegram. And actually, what's really interesting about that is that a lot of these services work in very similar ways. Um, so once you have a bot, you just have to figure out the slight differences between some of the, the platforms, but even a lot of them work in the same way. Um, and so if you want to chat with her bot on Facebook, you can just click on it. And this is going to open, oh, as Kathleen, is that OK? <laughs> You, yeah, I had this up on my computer. <laughs> yeah. Just ignore this stuff. <laughs> okay. um, so this is Esterbot, and uh, it's using the Facebook Messenger platform, which, like I said, you know, it works on iOS, it works on Android, it works through a web browser. And uh, with her bot, you just type in a question. Now, hers only works in all capitals, I think. Um, the first step is that you have to say something to it. So she said, get started by, by saying bot. And then it starts to give you some options. So it's like, I'm the personal bot of Esther, product marketer from San Francisco. Do you want to know more about bots or learn more about Esther? And what's really interesting about this, too, is that she originally bought it, it did, or built it. It didn't work like this initially. Just to like learn more about her, she had just graduated from university, and she wanted to get a job. And uh, she thought, what a unique way to like, put my resume online is if people could ask it this bot questions, and it would answer them like about her work experience and her interests and stuff. Um, so I, I guess I'll say I'm here for the bot. So what's interesting about the Facebook Messenger platform is you can create bots that just talk back and forth with simple messages, but they do have like some shortcuts and the ability to insert images, same way that you'd send your friend an image like of a picture that you took. Um, almost everything is possible that you can do with just a regular text message. And it says, hi, I thought so. Are you perhaps thinking about building your own bot? And then you can talk to it. Um, I'd like to. And then she's like, cool, if you want, I can email you instructions to creating your own bot for free, awesome, or nah. So it's just like, you know, really straightforward, and there's really just nothing to learn. You can just talk to it like you would a person. Um, what she's done is uh, if you want to play around with how she made her bot, if you Google, uh, GitHub Esterbot. You can find uh, the code. And this might seem a little intimidating at first, but what she actually does is walks you through the process really easily um, to get started. And if you just follow the instructions, it's very, very simple. She's taken, um, there's this platform called Smooch which is, uh, in general, like a customer service platform where you can talk to customers um, on your website, like a live chat sort of functionality. Um, and she's figured out a way to like kind of hack that and do her own bot with it. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, in starting to build your own bot, it's a really uh, simple way to get started. Oh, I got it back. So when I saw this, I used the, the platform and the tutorial that she had on her website. And uh, I thought about, what could I do to, uh, to make my own bot? 
I just want something that's really easy and I want to be predictable so like I know what people are going to ask. And where I work at One London Place, um, we have this amazing office. Uh, it's very like Facebook-like. But it's a massive office and there are like a million meeting rooms. And when we moved into the place, we thought it'd be really fun to name them all sorts of different things. Like the font and the furious and like LinkedIn Park and like all these different things like kind of making some, some puns and they're fun names but they don't tell you where anything is. And so all the time people will be like, oh, I just got invited to Google fellas. I have no idea where this meeting room is. Uh, and on top of this, they actually have two floors. So I knew, I heard people asking the same questions over and over again. I thought that might be a really easy way to build a bot because I, knew, I knew what they were gonna ask and I also knew where the rooms were. So it was easy to have a conversation back and forth. So this is room bot. Um, so I set up my bot using the same way that Esther did, but connected it to a service called Twilio, um, which is a, a text messaging SMS service. And uh, people can just text the name of the room that they want to go to, and then RoomBot will tell them where it is. And that's as simple as it is. It's basically just a matching sort of thing. It's looking for what you said, and then it's serving up the match. Um, but to the human, to the person, it feels like they're having a real conversation. Uh, this is a couple of other examples. and. Uh, when I was trying to think about how to give directions, I, <laughs> I tried to uh, give it um, the ability to for people to say things like, oh, okay, um, if she's in the south area of the floor, like which way is south? Because actually like a lot of people are directionally challenged, um, which I learned through building the bots and, and doing some user testing. Um, and uh, so now people can ask the questions too. We have like a color coding system, the way that the floors are painted. So trying to give people some, some direction. And this app was like a little bit more complicated because I wanted it to be text message based. A lot of the people that we work with, like we have a good mix of designers and developers, but some of them are a little hardcore about like not wanting to have a Facebook account. And so I wanted to make a system that I knew everyone had a phone and that everybody could text. So I wanted to create like a text based app so when someone sends a text to um, my bot, the bot really like lives in GitHub. But what happens is that the text goes to this messaging app and then it's posted on Heroku and the code lives on GitHub. And I was able to architect that all through the tutorial that Esther put together. And almost all this is free except for the Twilio SMS service. So if I had chosen to put this on the Facebook Messenger platform, it'd have the exact same architecture, except that um, it just wouldn't be textable. And uh, so I mentioned too, like that I was noticing how people were talking to the bot. Um, you can actually connect bots to more than one service at the same time with that Smooch platform. So while people are texting it, I actually also hooked up the bot to Slack, which is a messaging platform. And so when someone's texting the app, I can see what they're saying on the other side. So you can see here, it just gives them a random name. These are all the different like chats that the bot's having at the same time. And then they ask it a question and it tells them how to get there and they can ask another question and it tells them how to get there. Um, and it's been really good. But the funny part is that, you know, we've advertised it as a bot. We call it room bot. We've given a little presentation very similar to this, um, but people still talk to it like it's a human. So they'll be like, oh, thank you. That was really helpful. Or they'll say things like, I can't find it. Like, where can you tell me a different way to get to it? And like, I've even seen people like get mad at the bot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what, like that really says to me as a researcher and as an interaction designer is that like this is so convincing that even though there's a giant poster on the wall that says, text room bot and it has a photo of a robot that people instantly start feeling like they're talking to a person and it's just like hard to like not think about it that way because when you see an interface like this this is the same way that you probably talk to your friend or your mom or whatever and it's hard to forget that that's powered by a robot especially when it's talking to you like a person um which is really cool and i think like that's why this this platform will be so easy like easily approachable you don't have to learn how to scan a QR code that's like very foreign to you and you've never seen it before. Like everyone knows how to have a conversation. And from a customer service support perspective, like 
as one person, I can monitor like 10, 15, 20 conversations. So I can see like somebody's getting frustrated or whatever. I can actually jump in so I can start typing this code and I can talk to them instead of the bot and take over, um, which is like just wild to think about from a customer support perspective that one person could be helping 15, 20 people at the same time um, and making their experience better. These platforms are also trackable. So uh, with Twilio, it provides like really basic analytics. You can hook it up to other types of analytics. So you can see that when the bot first started out, it was like really popular and then it just sees like a little bit of usage like every now and then. Um, I don't actively promote it, so I could probably do a better job of that. But uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. It works, you can measure it and monitor it the same way that you can as a website, um, but people are interacting with it through a phone. Uh, so that's it. Um, I didn't want to take too much time because I know you guys have been here for a while and it's the, the end of the night before uh, a long weekend. Um, but I think what I would ask you to take away from this is to like, do a little bit of experimentation like Kathleen suggested and, and see what's out there and, and try to build your own bot. There's a lot of even uh, like generators. There's one called the bot father. It's like the godfather but the bot father. And you can just go and you can talk to it and you can build a bot just by talking to the bot. So they're using their own technology to help people to create these without having to know even like a line of code, um, which is amazing. So yeah, I conversational UX. Um, I think that it's a really exciting time to be a designer and a developer and a researcher. I think we're going to see this whole new wave of the way that customers interact with technology. And uh, you're right at the front of it. So, so go away and uh, bot. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Ashley? Cool. Uh, all the stuff is available if you go on Facebook Messenger and search for the brand name. I think Sephora, um, H&M, and 1800 Flowers. It's a whole bunch of them. If you search with what Facebook blocks are available right now, um, you can go ahead and you can start talking to one right away and you have the Facebook Messenger platform and try this out yourself. So you said um, if the avatar has a check mark? Yeah, if it has a, a bot? I think so, yeah, that's what they're saying. Okay. So I noticed that like celebrity Facebook pages, they have that check mark thing, and I always thought yeah. that that means there's a oh, no bot. Sorry, it's like a little, um, it has a little Messenger icon. I think that's the, the Icon. But there's a really great website called, I think it's called Bot Market. Uh, okay. I'm gonna do a little um, self promotion because I wrote. I wrote a little article on my Medium account that has a link to has links to a lot of uh, articles and resources. And at the bottom here, there's a list of all the Facebook Messenger bots that they know about, and I think they're trying to keep this up to date. But uh, some of these are American. Burger King and Tim Hortons have a bot that you can order food through. Um, CNN, eBay is almost ready to launch a bot where you can receive price alert updates. Um, Expedia, uh, the hotel uh, booking chain, will let you search and browse and book hotels inside of Messenger. Um, a few other ones that you might recognize. Rogers and Salesforce are working on them right now. Shopify doesn't have it yet, but almost. Spring Shoes, that's a really cool one. Uh, I use that one actually. So you can say to the bot, like I'm looking for black shoes in a size nine and it'll just show a whole bunch of pictures to you and you can order them through there, it's really cool. And Zendesk, which is a uh, help and support place, I recognize that one. Um, I think that TechCrunch um, has one too, where you can tell it like what your interests are. Like I like to know about wearables and the Internet of Things and like whatever. 
And then whenever they publish a story on that, they'll just send you a little message and say like, hey, there's a new story on that. Just check it out, it matches up with your interest. Um, so there's that. And there's also this resource called Botlist, which shows you all the bots across all the platforms, so not just Messenger. Um, but I think, yeah, on iPhone, so on Kick, on Slack, um, that you can also text, that you can Skype with. So almost every platform that people can use to message each other people are building bots for. And it's a lot of the same technology, just hooked up to different services. I, I thought it was that there would be the little, I think there's a little, maybe it has a little I, I just thought it would be great to like talk to celebrities. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like the fake. You could make one. Like the Twitter bots that aren't the real people, and they just tweet random things. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Yeah, so check out, uh, check out Botlist and uh, you know, try talking to a bot and you'll see it's not perfect, but either was the app store when it first started launching and app stores weren't, or the apps like that we first had when the app store was around weren't great, but now apps are like really great. There's like pretty, you have certain expectations of them that they're going to be great, um, but they weren't always, it took time to get there. I think it'll be the same with conversational UX, like people will struggle and it may be like the technology won't be perfect at first, but it'll get really good really fast because of the way that they're integrating it with all of these different platforms that people already use, so. One of the things from the conference that I wasn't able to bring in to the talk was the idea of the Facebook Messenger and how that was used in Messenger. And I was to like buddy up with someone too. Like, so maybe if you're not like, Comfortable. Like I mentioned, that when I like play around with the SVG thing, um, like maybe if I buddy up with someone and like work together, maybe with someone who has good illustration skills <laughs> or something like that, like partnering up with someone giving you like accountability and stuff like that. Yeah. And also, I was wondering, like, if anyone here has any um, experiments or things that they've been thinking about playing with or, I don't know. What was the name of that button again? Oh, um, it'll be. I tried to look it up. On, it'll be in. Okay. I'll have to check it out. I was immediately like, hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah like, I want to get like that. I'm going to play around and just try messing with something like physical. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like even babies learning code, how they or kids learning code, they have like the um, Wiki Wiki. Have you guys heard of that? How lovely it is! It's like this cool like um, like these allocated clips that you can put up to like uh, connect to anything that um, has like software or something. But it's like you can. Do you look up Wiki Wiki? <laughs> Oh yeah, it's really awkward, isn't it? It's like it's just like a really easy way to experiment with different ideas. It's so easy that make like make oh. M A K E Y, I think. Monkey? Yeah, yeah. yeah make makey. Oh no, makey makey. It's oh makey makey. <laughs> but it's so it's so um they made it so easy for anyone to use that that's what they use. Oh, okay. Sounds great, actually. But like, I just love this idea of like experimenting, and it doesn't even need to be perfect. You're gonna figure out. Make it easy. Well, this is pretty cool. Yeah, this is. So that's the making it because it's a little allocated that's going to be really If anything has like, I do with water. So you can test That's cool. <laughs> this is a lead. Wow. <laughs>
That's cool. Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm Eric. We're graduate students at MIT Media Lab. We're here to learn how to make your own videos. Cool, yeah. I guess the common theme today is experiment and try, and try new technology and new things. And uh, let us know what you make. If you make anything cool or you try talking to a bot, send us a screenshot to our Twitter account or hashtag it. And send it to us. And uh, we'd love to see what you guys try out after seeing all this tonight. So thank you to Kathleen. Thank you to the River Room and, uh, or sorry, Rhino Lounge and uh, Lighthouse Labs. I hope you guys check out their program. Have a good night. Yeah, we should have a meeting. It can be super chill. Yeah, we can have a meeting.